Hi, this is Dr. Nick with the last chapter in this section of the normal ECG. We're going to talk about measuring intervals because this is one of the first things that we do when we're trying to interpret an ECG. So as far as measuring is concerned, we've got this tape measure that I kind of remember. Uh, my grandmother was a seamstress and she'd whip one of these things out and start measuring all different parts of my body. But um, we're going to talk more about the ECG and how do you measure different intervals and you can start to make electrocardiographic diagnosis. Well, first, a quick review. Here is a typical grid that you see. You've got large boxes and you've got small boxes. Remember that small boxes are one millimeter apart. If you assume the standard measurements of a normal ECG machine, you have 0 0.1 millivolts high for each little box and uh, 40 milliseconds wide for each little box, and the big boxes are 200 milliseconds wide. For those of you who are used to seconds, there's 25 millimeters in a second, so that's five big boxes. That means each box is one-fifth of a second. I frankly don't like using fractions, but um, some people do. Anyway, so much for the grid. Let's talk about the ECG. If you recall, the atrial depolarization gives you a small bump known as a P wave. Ventricular depolarization results in a QRS complex. And then there's always a relaxation wave known as the T wave. So that's the QRS, and here's the T wave. Other parts that we need to be concerned about, the PR segment, which is the part between the P and the QRS complex, the ST segment, between the S wave, remember the first negative deflection is a Q, then the first positive deflection is an R, and following the R you can have an S wave, and then you have the ST segment which is between the S wave and the T wave. Remember the point where the QRS complex ends and the ST segment begins is known as the J point. Now there are a couple of extra waves that can be seen under certain circumstances. Okay, let's draw another EKG over here. Here's a P wave. Now, in some people who have an abnormal electrical system, they may actually have a slurred upstroke of their QRS complex. And this is known as a delta wave. And we'll talk about that in the advanced course when dealing with the Wolf-Parkinson-White or WPW syndrome. But what this does is it causes the QRS complex to widen, start early, and the PR interval um, is almost non-existent in those patients. Okay, sometimes you'll have inverted T waves in these patients. And uh, there's one last wave that I want to mention because it is considered part of the QRS complex, and that's known as an epsilon wave. And that'll that's found at the uh, at the tail end of the QRS complex. Sometimes it's high frequency like this, and sometimes it's just widening at the uh, tail end of the QRS. These are seen in certain cardiac illnesses and conditions, and we'll talk about that also in the advanced course. Now, what measurements are important? Well, there's the R to R interval that gives us our heart rate, and we talked about that in the last chapter. The intervals that we measure on a QRS complex include the PR interval, which is from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. That PR interval tells us something about the AV conduction system. The duration of the QRS complex, how long does a QRS take to inscribe? That's from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the QRS. And then the other interval that needs to be measured is known as the QT interval, which is the beginning of the QRS complex to the very end of the T wave, where the T wave comes back to the baseline. If you consider um, this to be the baseline of the QRS complex, where the T wave comes back to baseline, that's considered the end of the T wave. Now, every now and then you will see um, something else that's unusual, and we're going to talk about this in the advanced course. Sometimes is what you'll see is a T wave and then a second bump following it. So this is a T and this is a U. Some people think that this is sort of all part of the T wave, 
but usually the U wave is a discrete separate signal and can also be seen in certain abnormal conditions that we'll talk about in the advanced course. All right, so now that we've kind of reviewed all these different parts of the QRS complex, let's start practicing because, after all, we need to measure some of these things. Okay, so uh, here's our normal 18-year-old. And um, if you uh, kind of glance at this uh, ECG, it's lead 2. If you remember your vectors, um, lead 2 is in this direction, down and to the right, or down and to the patient's left. It's 60 degrees above the horizontal, right? So that's from right arm to left leg. That's just a, a quick review of uh, electrocardiographic axes. Okay, but that's not important to this discussion. What I want to talk about is first measuring R to R interval. Okay, so find an R to R that's on a, kind of close to um, uh, a heavy line. Like take this one. Now it's it's off about 20 milliseconds, so you have to take that into consideration. And what I like to do is just kind of look for the same spot on this heavy box. So that's 200, 400, 600, 800, 1,000, another 40 milliseconds. So that's 1,040 milliseconds. If you needed to count rate, that would be 300, 150, 175, 60, a little below that, so that's 58 beats per minute. That's a number that we've seen before, isn't it? So 58 beats per minute, the R to R interval is 1040. Okay, now what about the PR? Well, you're going to look for the beginning of the P wave as best as you can tell. Now here's a P wave that's right on the heavy line here. So you measure the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. Okay, you have to be precise with this. So sometimes it helps to take out a pair of calipers. And there they are, our trusty calipers. You can pick them up and you lay down one point at the very beginning of the P wave. And then the other point goes at the very beginning of the QRS complex. And that measures out the PR interval. And then you pick up the calipers without moving the points, of course. And you lay it on a heavy line. And then you count off how many milliseconds is this, okay? So that's... 40, 80, 120, and just about 160 milliseconds. Now, if, if you're off by 10, it's no big deal. A lot of times it's really hard to put these calipers on precisely, but try to be within 10 to 20 milliseconds in your measurement. So we're going to call this PR interval 150 milliseconds because I can actually see it with my eyeballs. I think maybe the calipers, we should have made them a little smaller. But you have to use your eyes. Now, what about the QRS duration? Well, here's where the QRS starts, and here's where the QRS ends. And here, calipers are important, but I would say that you have a little more than two small boxes here. So if it was two small boxes, it would be 80. This is probably about 90 milliseconds, and that's the QRS duration. Now. Let's kind of look at another QRS complex. Let's look at this one just to kind of double check because, after all, there are a couple here. Now, you can see the QRS ends just before the heavy line, and it starts just before this light line. And so you have two boxes almost exactly. And here as well. I mean, I, I think perhaps on second thought, um, this is probably more like 80 or 85 milliseconds I think the computer would probably read it somewhere between 80 and 90. All right, so that's the QRS duration. And that's important because when you have delay within the interventricular conduction system, you'll have uh, something known as an interventricular conduction delay, and the very specific types of those delays are called bundle branch blocks. We'll talk about that in the advanced course. Finally, the QT interval well, since this is landing on a light line, uh, let's count off. We can, we can uh, do 40, 80, 120, 160, 200. 40, 80, 120. And it comes right back down here at about 160. So 200 plus 160 is 360. And that's the QT interval. Now, the one measurement that we didn't talk about is the corrected QT interval. The corrected QT interval which is abbreviated QTC. 
is derived from a formula, and the reason we need it is because the QT interval, because it represents the combination of depolarization and then repolarization, it actually changes depending upon the patient's rate. The QT interval gets shorter at faster rates, and this has to be considered because a QT interval at one rate may not be normal at a different rate. Just to make it easy though, just remember that the QT interval should shorten at faster rates. I think a quick and easy way for people to get a sense of whether the QT is in the normal range is that the, the T wave should not really extend past the midpoint between two QRS complexes. So if you look at these two QRS complexes and you figure the midpoint is around here someplace, clearly this T wave ends on time and uh, it's not prolonged. Certain medical conditions can cause the QT interval to become prolonged, and there's even a condition known as the congenital long QT syndrome that we'll talk about in the advanced course as well. And uh, one of the ways to diagnose that is to just measure the corrected QT interval. So how do you correct the QT interval to account for the heart rate? Well, the corrected QT interval is equal to the QT interval that you measure times 1 over the square root of the R to R interval, and that's in seconds. Okay, so it's a bit of a calculation, but it's not that hard you, if you have a calculator and you can figure out square roots. Otherwise, there are tables that you can look up to see what a normal QTC is for any particular heart rate. So in this example, your R to R interval is 1,040 milliseconds, but in seconds, that's uh, 1 over the square root of 1.04. Get it? This is in seconds, so you have to shift the decimal point over three spaces, one, two, three, because we're dealing with thousandths of a second here, which has three zeros, and here you're dealing with seconds. So I'll bring my calculator up and I'll put 1.04, that's the seconds. We'll take the square root of that and then press the one over button. And that gives you a conversion factor. Now multiply that times the QT interval that we measured, which is 360. And that equals 353. Because the heart rate is so close to 60, now with 60, the R to R interval is one second, and this whole calculation fudge factor basically becomes one. So the QT at 60 beats per minute is equal to the QTC. So here you can see it's only just slightly lower at 353 milliseconds. What's the normal? In males, the normal is 420 or less, and the upper limited normal in females is 440 milliseconds. So this one's fine, okay. So those are all the intervals that you'd normally measure. Well, I think I'll end this video at this point because it's getting kind of long, but I'm going to add one more video to this section in order to give you some more practice in measuring intervals. So for the ECG Academy, this is Dr. Nick. So go ahead and watch the next video for some more practice.